what are we going to talk about today? The first thing I will do is to discuss uh, failures, how you model failures. In order to build a good model for data durability, the first thing you have to do is to understand how your devices fail. So once you uh, understand that, then you can decide what kind of erasure coding you need to meet your durability targets. So this will be, first of all, a general formalism. I will introduce the general formalism. I will talk about rate five and rate six a little bit. Uh, and I will also review few uh, models that you can readily find online and I will compare them. I will also introduce a very precise method which, which gives very accurate results uh, when you compare the results against simulation. It's a Markov chain analysis. So we will then take that uh, particular method, Markov chain analysis, and we will apply them to the cases which are more complicated, like the case with the hard errors so, uh, or unrecoverable errors. Once we are done with that, we'll go forward and we'll address another technology which is supported in POS in Seagate's uh, enclosures. That's the distributed parity. So uh, this requires quite a bit of math to, to resolve, but I will just show you the highlights of it and show how ADAPT will give you uh, gain in durability. And once you have all the ingredients here, you can go one step further and you can discuss uh, the case of multi-layer erasure coding. So you, you can have some erasure coding in the box and then you may decide to add another layer on top and we can address uh, this um, case with, uh, with Markov chain analysis. And until now, everything will be related to durability and I, I dedicate one slide uh, to the analysis of availability. So I will show how to model that. And finally, since we have all of these ingredients, um, what you can do is to put everything together into a web application. And I just want to show you a glimpse of it uh, so that uh, you can put all these results into a web page, uh, which is Seagate internal at this moment, uh, so that people can come and uh, compute those metrics easily. And I've included a couple of things in the backup, uh, but I don't think I will have time to go through them. One is related to the dual actuator, uh, which is two times faster than a regular drive, and it will give you some benefits in durability. The other thing is related to reman, which allows the drives to continue, uh, even though they may lose one head or two. But they will be in the appendix, and we can go there if you have any particular question. So what, what is the goal here? What are the goals we want to accomplish in this presentation? The first uh, goal is to provide a quick review of available models you can find you know, on the internet. Um, and then I will introduce a rigorous method uh, which gives you very good answers if you compare them against the simulations. But the overall goal here is to establish a common, common language uh, to compute such metrics because if you pick a model and compare the numbers you get out of it against another one, you will see that they, the, the numbers may be different by orders of magnitude. So I just want to go through this uh, so that you can compare all of those available models so that you can make an informed decision. And the takeaways from uh, this uh, presentation will be that uh, there are good models out there that you can use to model um, durability. And my favorite method is the Markov chain analysis. That's because it's based on rigorous math and you can uh, confirm your answers with simulations. And the other thing is that you can use this mathematical methodology to solve uh, complex problems like distributed parity, Riemann or URES and other, other uh, technologies that will require uh, advanced modeling techniques. And all of this work is developed with the, uh, with the collaboration uh, with the folks from uh, Pods and Cortex architects, at the architects and sales team. And so all of the results will be here in, in close mathematical form. That means you can do the computations uh, instantly. So that, that means you can put everything together into a web application and you get the answer immediately. So the, the, the main message uh, or the, the last message I want to deliver in this presentation is that we are committed to this uh, modeling work and we will be uh, modeling uh, all the advanced features of pods and cortex and we, we are 
willing to share those results with the open source community. And if you have questions, we'll be happy to uh, discuss um, related to, to the uh, durability calculations or availability calculations. So let's get started. So the first thing you have to do is to understand how your devices fail. And typically people use viable distribution to model uh, the device failures. So it goes uh, with certain functions. Don't worry too much about the functions here. The idea here is that this particular distribution has two free parameters, alpha and beta, and you can tweak those parameters so that you can describe your device failures very rigorously and very successfully. And typically your beta it will be between one and two, but it will depend on the conditions you're running your devices at. And what people usually do is they take beta equals to one because that, that will simplify your life and it, it will be basically the exponential distribution and everything will be defined by a single parameter, which is the failure rate, which is related to the AFR, annualized failure rate, right? So this is a way to go so you can define your failure distributions uh, with exponential distribution, but you have to you have to work on this a little bit. And I just want to explain this a little further with some visuals. So uh, if you take beta equals to one, uh, that is exponential distribution, what you're assuming is that your failures, which are shown here, are happening randomly. So they have to they have no memory, everything is happening at constant rate. So this is typically a good uh, approximation or a good uh, method, but it doesn't always hold. Maybe uh, you are better with some other parameter beta equals to two. In this case, for example, your you won't have any failures in the early days, but your failure rate will go up and up. So the takeaway from this slide is that first you have to understand how your devices fail, whether it's SSD or HDD or some other storage device, you have to study your failures and then decide how to fit, uh, fit those uh, failures. Typically, Vable is a good fit. You just need to decide what alpha and beta to use. If you have your own data, you can look at your data and decide what numbers you should use. If you have no data, you'll have to rely on the numbers that the manufacturer gives you. For example, if you, if you wanna rely on the numbers Seagate provides. So what we are saying is that beta equals to one is a good fit most of the time. So you just use exponential distribution and you have to use alpha such that your AFR is 0.35%. That corresponds to two and a half million hours MTTF. So that's the first takeaway. So you have to study your data first. Uh, and then the other takeaway is that no matter how re reliable your devices are, they will fail because you will have tens of thousands of those devices in a in a uh, data center and th there will be lots of failures. That's why you have to introduce some redundancy. You have to uh, do some erasure coding. And I have a plot here that shows a bit of history about the um, erasure coding. The simplest thing you do is to replicate your data. You just clone your data, but you can right away see that it has it has a very poor capacity efficiency. If you clone your data, you're down to 50% capacity efficiency already, and it will just get worse. And that's why people introduced RAID 5 and RAID 6 uh, like three decades ago, and those technologies introduce one parity or two, and that they will protect you against one failure or two. And then you can get a little more sophisticated, uh, like in the Seagate enclosures, you can do distributed parity, uh, so that you get a little more benefit uh, as you distribute your uh, stripes across the pool of drives. But the what we want to get at towards the end of the presentation is that as you go towards this, as you introduce multi-layer erasure coding, what you get out of it is that you can get very good durability, very good availability, and you can do, do them both with very good uh, capacity efficiency with little overhead. So the idea is that you, you just create some redundancies and you, you put those data pieces and in, into different storage media, different devices. And the simplest way is to just create parity. This is just an introductory, introductory material here. So if you have two bytes of B1 and B2, in order to create a redundancy, you can create a parity by XORing those bytes bitwise. So that will give you the parity. And then what you do is you take B1, B2, and P, put them into three different devices. And if one of them fails, you can reconstruct it by 
doing a bit uh, again XOR operation. So that will give you um, fault tolerance against one failure. And you can extend this idea to more redundancies using Reed Solomon algorithm. So you can create C pieces of redundancy that will give that will protect you against C simultaneous device failures. Then the main question becomes what is the probability of having C plus one simultaneous failures? And that will be the main problem we are trying to address in this presentation. So let's take a look at the uh, earliest examples of this rate five and six. And this will also be kind of an introduction to Markov chain and methodology. So what you see here is the state diagram of rate six. So you will see some arrows. For example, the red arrows will show you the failure. So you start with um, 12 healthy drives here, and then you may fail, and you, one, one of them may fail, and you will be in this state. And this failure rate is represented by the red arrow here. And the rate will scale with the number of drives you have in the system. And there's one other thing which is kind of ignored in the uh, in the industry for some reason. It is related to the UERs. So if, as you are reading your data, you may discover that some of your sectors are gone, say they're corrupted. So uh, you, you may lose data without drives failing. So it may be just a loss of one single sector. And the green arrows here show you the uh, recovery process. As you rebuild your data, you can go back to a, an healthier state. And uh, so the question here is, you are going to lose data if you end up in this state or in this state. And the question is, how do you compute the probability of that happening? And before I move on, I just want to show you something. Um, let me dial this back and I will just pull this up. Let's say you have 30 drives and you don't introduce any redundancy at all, which is not a good idea. So this means that you can start from 30 healthy drives, but there's a good chance that you're going to lose one drive in a year or so. So that's why you have to introduce one redundancy at least, right? So that means you will be able to recover from a single uh, um, failure using the parity that you that you had uh, created. But the tricky thing here is that while you are in this state, while you are actively recovering from one failure, if you have another failure, so basically your data is dead. So there's no way you can recover it because you have two failures at the same time. So that's why maybe you should go and do two redundancies. That will be rate six. And so the, the idea here is that you have to decide how many redundancies you have to introduce and that will be set by your target. What is the durability you want to achieve? And before the end of the presentation, I'll show you that you can model rate five and rate six and you can compute the data durability for those configurations and they will be given by these formulas for this is for uh, rate five and you'll have rate six here and rate six will be basically three orders magnitude better than rate five. And there's no reason you should stop at two, right? Maybe you need more reliability. Uh, maybe you have a mission critical data and you want to go with even higher redundancies. So the way you would do it would be to introduce more and more redundancies. So this was the introductory part. Let's do some math and we want to compute the numbers, the probabilities of losing data. And I will start very gently and I will start with the, with the simplest model that I pulled from the internet. This is not my model, but if you're searching for a model, you may come across this particular one. So what you do is you define your input parameters. You, you first uh, define how many drives you will have in the system, in the erasure coded system, your capacity, redundancy, recover speed, and AFR. Those are your inputs to the model. And this is the recovery speed, not to be confused with the drive read write speed, because our drives are capable of 250 megabytes per second or so. But this is the part you allocate for recovery. Then what you do is you compute how long it would take to restore a full drive. If you have 16 terabyte drives, and if you do things with 50 megabytes per second, that will take 3.7 days. Then the next step is to compute the probability of losing a drive in 3.7 days. And you can do that by uh, using AFR and the time, you just multiply them together. And this is the number that gives you the probability of losing one drive in 3.7 days. 
then since you have three redundancies, you claim that you are going to lose the data only if you lose four drives at once. And the, the probability of that happening will be the fourth power of this number. So that is the probability to lose data. And if you subtract it out of one, that is your data durability, which is reported in this so-called units of nines, which is kind of a funny unit. Uh, what you do is you compute your durability, which will be a number that is very close to one with lots of nines in it. And you just count how many nines it has in, in inside. So if, for example, if you end up with 998, this thing has two nines. 9991, this is three nines. Mathematically, it will look like this. It's the log 10 basis logarithm of the probability uh, floor down to the nearest uh, integer. So this is a very simple uh, model, as you can see. Uh, you can do this uh, on the back of an envelope, but there is a problem here. It is wrong. It's actually very wrong. And I'll show you that this actually gets the number by uh, five orders magnitude wrong. And I just want to highlight this because this is one of the models you can find online. And this is just a warning for people who are trying to model this and they, they, they're just grabbing a random model from the internet. So it can be very wrong uh, for various reasons. The first reason is that this is not even an erasure coding with 17 plus three. This is basically one plus three. So you have the original data and you create three copies of it. So this is one plus three, not 17 plus three. And you can see that from the fact that the, the number 20 here didn't even enter into your equation. So you can change this and none of the numbers here will change because you didn't even put it in your model, which is just which is just wrong, right? The way it would have entered into your equations would be through the binomial coefficients because if you have 20 drives, there are so many different ways you can fail four out of them. So it, precisely this would be the number of the combinations. So this model is missing the uh, coefficients. And the other thing is, it's not even the durability over a year. It's just a durability over 3.7 days. And you have to extend this all the way to a year. And um, if you put all, everything together, you'll see that this is wrong by five orders. And the other thing is, is that this one doesn't even include your URES. And if you, this is the hard errors, the bad sectors. If you add on uh, the URES, you're going to lose uh, two orders more. So this model is wrong by about seven orders or eight orders. So we have to do a little better than that. And let's go to a better model, which was introduced by Backblaze back in 2018. And they have a blog on this, which is very, very nice. So you can go and read it. And they also kindly uh, shared their code, a Python code, to do the computation. It goes very similarly. You def define your inputs. And then I did set them a little differently so that I can match what they have in their uh, analysis. So what they are saying is that in their system, they can recover uh, one drive in six and a half days. So what I did was to adjust this uh, recovery speed so that I, I get six and a half days as the recovery time. And then um, what you do is you compute the uh, failure rate, which is related to AFR, which they take as 0.4. And that's a, that's a good number. That's actually very close to what we use as default. And then you compute the probability of losing one drive. Now, until now, everything is the same uh, compared to the previous model, but now it will start diverging. So what you say is you're going to lose the data. You're not going to lose the data if you have at most three failures. Then you can compute the probability of that happening, which turns out to be 13 nines. And one last, so this fixes the error the other model has. So it, it puts in the coefficients properly. And one last thing they, they do is to observe the fact that this is only over six and a half days and you have to extend this all the way to a year. So you slice your full year into six and a half days, which is 156 hours. So it turns out that there are 56 such frames in a year. So you have to just take the power of this probability to the NF that will give you 11 nines. So this model is still simple and it gets you an answer, but it has a couple of issues. Again, um, the first issue is that you segment your full year into these frames, which is kind of arbitrary. 
and that will cause your model to miss failures which are happening in between these frames. If you have two failures right here, if you have two more right here, the model will not see those failures. So it's just missing such, such cases. And the other thing is uh, somewhat related to the previous one is that this model assumes that if we exit from one frame with no data loss, you will start the next frame just like you're brand new like you have three redundancies, which is clearly not the case because you may exit from the first frame with zero failure, one failure, two failure, up to three failures. So this is not P, this will be a different P. So you cannot just take the NF power of the P you computed here. Um, to be fair, this model is not too bad. So it just gives you the durability off by a factor of two. So if you report things in the log units, in number of nines, that's an offset of 0 0.3, which is not too bad. So nobody will hold it against you. But the main problem with this model is that it doesn't include URES. So it doesn't include um, corrupted sectors. And if you were to put those, which you should, um, you will see that uh, the durability will go down by two nines or so. And we can actually do better than this uh, with less uh, math. And I will refer to this as the most intuitive model. And you can, you can see this online as well. And the idea is to follow the concepts from availability. So if you have a repayable system with n drives, your mean time to failure will be one hour n times lambda. So this is the average time for the system to show one failure. And you are going to repair this, and it's typically a few days or so, depending on your repair rate. So your MTTR is one over mu. So the amount of time, the fraction of time, you will be in the repair process will be this ratio mean time to repair divided by the total time but typically uh, mean time to repair is short order of few days and mean time to failure is very large it's order of 100 years actually so you can approximate this with this ratio so this is again the fraction of the time you will be in the repair process and things may go wrong when you are doing the repair and the the wrong uh, the, the thing that can go wrong is another failure and you have n minus one healthy drives running at that stage. That means your failure rate will be n minus one times lambda. And if you multiply this rate with uh, with the fraction of the time you are there, this will be your uh, rate to data loss. And you flip it over and you get your MTTDL1. That is the mean time to data loss with one redundancy. And this is precisely the MTTDL for rate five. And you can re reiterate this, you can get the answer for uh, rate six that has two redundancies. So this is very intuitive and you, you get this uh, with little math and you can, you, there's no reason why you should stop at two. You can push this to any generic C and you will get this answer. Um, so this is a very good intuitive model. The only problem with this is that um, it is really hard to extend this to more complicated cases. So there's no easy way to include URES, for example. There's no easy way to include distributed parity. And that's why you have to pull the big guns here. So you have to do a little more rigorous math to solve your problem. And that's where the Markov chain analysis comes in. It's just a methodology to describe statistical uh, stochastic processes. So what you do is you first draw your state diagram for your system. So this is a system with one redundancy. You start with n healthy drives. You lose one, you come here, you repair one, you go back. And if you are, if while you are here, if you take another uh, hit, you will go to the data loss state. So you draw this diagram and then you assign probabilities of being at each node and then you write down a differential equation that governs your system. So the probability of being here will go down as you go out and it will increase as you come in. So this is your equation to solve and you can use whatever you like to solve differential equations. I like Laplace transforms particularly. So you go through this math and you solve for this PF because that's the state you are interested in. That's the state of failure and if you subtract it out of one, that's your reliability. So you have to go through this math and math is a little tedious and I, I, I won't show it. Uh, but if you, if you just follow through, you'll get the answer. 
And the reason why we are doing this is again, it's it's basically the only tool uh, you have to solve more complicated problems like distribution parity or URES. So that's that's uh, what you have to do. And you may ask, uh, and you you'll be right to ask, how do you know that this, this is a good model? So you you can verify this model by doing a simulation. So you you just create millions of millions of systems with certain number of drives in it, in in them, and then you just pull random numbers from a viable distribution to simulate failures, and then you just count if your system had more failures than it can handle, uh, more more failures than the redundancies it has. And then it's just a counting game. And here what I'm showing is uh, the number of nines you would get from the Markov chain analysis on the x-axis and this is the simulation results and you can see they are uh, on one to one line in terms of the number of nines as we defined earlier so this is the number of nines we defined so the durability you get from simulation is the same as the one you get from uh, from the theory so it's very successful so let's take this model and apply it to a a problem which you cannot solve with those intuitive models or the other models that I covered. That's the URE problem, that's unrecoverable errors. So let me ex first explain what they are. So those are the sectors that went bad for some reason, and there are multiple reasons for that. It may be a thermal decays of bits, it may be scratches, contamination, or maybe there's too much activity uh, in the adjacent track in terms of hard drives, and you, you kind of erase the next track. But I should emphasize that Seagate drives have lots of features in them to avoid UREs. So if you're constantly uh, doing some scrubbing, et cetera, within the drive to prevent these from happening, but they will happen once in a while. And we have a number to quantify how often they, they happen. And a typical number is 10 to the minus 15. And that is the rate of, uh, bad sectors you're going to see per bits you read. And that may look like a small number. You may say, who cares about 10 to the minus 15? But you should keep in mind that now we are dealing with terabytes of data, actually tens of terabytes of data per drive, and you have tens of drives. So we are, we are basically playing with petabytes of data. That means as you read one petabyte of data, you are very likely to observe a bad sector. So it should be an integral part of the model. And the way you would do it with Markov chains would be like this. So most of this diagram is should be familiar from the previous one. The only thing I added here is this line. So that is related to the um, uh, hard errors. So the point here is that while you are recovering from uh, a failure, so you have to go and read all your drives, right? So, you, so that you can reconstruct the data. You read all the healthy drives, take that data, push it through the uh, read Solomon uh, algorithm in the inverse way, and you recompute the data you lost on that particular drive. But while you are reading the data, you may hit a bad sector. So you're trying to read a sector and it's gone. And there's nothing you can do about it at this moment because you lost your only parity when when that drive failed already. So when you, when you hit a UER, you, you are going to lose that sector. So that's the setup. And then you have to go through the math, which I want to hear. So when you do that, you will realize that your uh, durability, which is equivalent to MTTDL here, will be an harmonic sum of two things, which is which which makes a lot of sense, right? Because you have two modes here. One is related to drive failures, and the other one is related to the um, sector failures. And although this equation is for single parity, you can repeat this exercise and you will see the very same thing when you have C parities, a generic parity number. And it will be a harmonic sum of drive failures and the sector failures. So one thing you have to check is what this H is. Again, that's the probability of getting a UER. And you have to go through this little math to compute what that number is. And if it is not small enough, this term will dominate your reliability or durability. And I'll just take an example here. Let's say you are 10 to the minus 15 with 20 drives, 10 terabyte each, and you go just go through this uh, numerical computation. 
and it turns out that the probability of getting a UER while you are in the critical mode, while you are recovering one failure, will be 78%, which is practically one um, in that sense. So that means that um, UR is very significant, and it will kill your loss redundancy practically. If you want to remember one line from this slide, it will be this bottom line. So if you, the sector level data durability of an EC with C parities is at the order of drive level durability with C minus one parities. This is because whenever you go into the critical mode, it is almost guaranteed that you are going to see, an, you, you see a UER. So this is pretty much all about the UER. Let's go to the next technology that we want to address. That's the distributed parity. This is a very cool technology and what it does is it distributes all of your stripes across a pool of drives rather than clustering them into, into uh, groups. And that gives you the ability to read from the whole drive, a whole system as you recover from the uh, from failures. And the, the main idea, the reason why you are getting gain in durability is, is, is that you can prioritize um, recovery of stripes which are damaged more. So you just go and fix them first. Let me explain what it means. So you have, I have a representation here that shows the Venn diagram of a pool with 53 drives. And let's say we are doing eight plus two erasure coding inside. So this is your pool, 100% by definition. And if you have one failure, that will take down 19% of your stripes. They will be damaged once. And if you have another failure, that will also take 19% of your stripes. And there will be an overlap. The overlap will be 3.3% because of the geometric shapes of the, um, of the failures here in this representation. So that means that only 3.3% of your stripes will be double damaged. And what ADAPT does is it will go and it will go and fix those first so that they are critical in the, they are in critical condition, right? So if you fix them first, you'll be in a better shape. And you can go to the, you can develop the same uh, mathematical technology to solve this problem. So this will be your Markov chain approximately. And then you can go through the math. And at the end of the day, what you get is this nice equation. So what this equation tells you is that the, the durability with D-rate, that's the distributed rate, can be expressed in terms of the durability that you would get from traditional rate with a prefactor. This it's this this number. And when C is two, that's two parities, this just becomes one. So the gain you get from distributed parity is basically your relative pool size. D is the pool size here, N is uh, the EC size, which is 10 in this case. So this is 53, this is 10. So overall, this thing is five. So the bottom line is, is that if you implement ADAPT, you get a factor of five gain in your in, in the reliability. Uh, and that's, that's because you are prioritizing the fix of these uh, double damage stripes because in, they are in vulnerable condition. And I just want to elaborate on this a little more with a better visual uh, for you to understand the, the effect of the pool size. So this is a different uh, way of looking at things uh, compared to the Venn diagram that I showed earlier. So this is your pool. And if you have one failure, you are going to take down about 19% of, um, of your stripes. So they will be damaged once. And the second failure will overlap with those at some level. And what you get is 3.3%. And this is a better visual because I can play with the pool size here. If I just push this up all the way to 106 drives. So the overlap of those circles, if you remember from the previous slide, will, will decrease relatively speaking. So that will mean that only, for example, in this case, only 0.8% of the of the stripes will be double damaged um, with two failures. So it, it's a very small volume and you can fix them very fast because the data will be smaller. To, and in this case, as I said, if you remember the formula from the previous slide, the gain you get uh, is the relative pool size, 106 divided by 10 in this case, that will be 10. So if you do adapt with, with a pool of 106 drives, you get a factor of 10 
in, in, the, in the durability. So you get a gain of 10, which is one, one, nine, one additional line. Okay, so this gives us all the ingredients we need to go to the next level. And, and so what we wanna do is to build another layer on top. So you have all these fancy distributed parity and stuff in the box, and they, that will give, they will give you a very, very good enclosure, which is very reliable. In fact, they, uh, the pods itself can be as reliable as six or seven nines, depending on your input parameters. And then what you want to do is to put all of those pods together. Let's say you, you are going to take eight of them together, and then you're going to do eight, seven plus one erasure coding on top of them. So first of all, you have to simplify your life a little bit because there is a lot of things going on inside pods, but you, you, you really don't, don't care about what, what is inside the pods. You would just want to know whether the pods is alive or not, and what is the probability of pods failing. And as I said, it's about 10 to the minus six. So you will squish all of this drama going on inside pods into a single box. So it will be a basically a drive that has a capacity of petabyte and it has an AFR of 10 to minus six. So I just put this visual here to uh, deliver the message here. So from the user perspective, you don't really care about what is going inside the pods. So from, from your perspective, you just want to look at this beautiful uh, dock, uh, which looks so cool and it looks um, effortless and it, it looks healthy, but underneath there's a lot of drama going on, right? There's a lot of data paddling, et cetera. But from the user's perspective, you just want to know whether the duck is still floating or not. So once you do that, you what you do is you take these um, boxes, which are pods in this case, and you just daisy chain them with the top layer. Uh, and then you can use the sa very same techniques that I uh, described until now to compute the overall durability. You have now devices which are uh, which have AFRs of 10 to minus six, and you just create another layer of redundancy. And then you can go through the same exercise and you can compute the overall durability, which is expressed like this. But why do we care? Do we care because uh, we get some benefits out of it. And I, I just want to throw some numbers at you. For example, let's consider uh, 16 plus to adapt with 53 drive pool in the box, that's the pods configuration. And then on top of it, you build seven plus one with Cortex. So with this configuration, you are going to get 13 nines so with, with typical input parameters, which I'm not showing here. Um, and you will get that with 27% overhead. And you just need to compare it against, let's say a single layer energy coding. Let's say you take uh, eight plus five. This is kind of a random number, you, but you can repeat this exercise for, for different configurations. So this particular uh, configuration will give you 12 nines, but its capacity efficiency will be 62% compared to 73. So multi-layer erasure coding is giving you better capacity efficiency with better durability. So it's 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 no brainer to go with with that one. And one thing I didn't mention was the availability. Since you introduced uh, redundancy at the top layer, like seven plus one, if one pod goes down for uh, reasons which are not related to drives, maybe the switch is down, maybe the power supply is down, your data is still there, but you just cannot access it through that particular pod. But since you have redundancies across other pods, you can just compute it on the fly and still serve the data. So your your availability will be will be still good in that sense, and again, what the top layer does for you is that if something goes with the uh, pods itself, maybe it will lose data, right? At some rate, or maybe uh, there will be a fire in the server, maybe there will be a power surge in the power supply, and there's a chance that you will kill all the pods at once. But what this top layer does for you is that even if one particular pod dies, you can still recover it from the parities you have across the other pods. So that's the that's the main point here. Okay, so everything I talked about until now was related to data durability, but you can use the same techniques uh, to address data availability. And it's a separate thing from 
from durability. So there are many things that can go wrong that will reduce your availability. You, maybe your service is down, your switches are down, maybe you have some power issues, but your data will be still there. You just cannot access it. You can use the same technology here in terms of math to compute the availability. And this is very similar to the one I discussed and I refer to as the most intuitive method. So if you have devices and devices, and those are not drives at this moment, those are devices like uh, servers, switches, or whatever, right? Everything that goes behind uh, drives that serve the data to the uh, outside world. Uh, if you have any of those, and if you describe each with some lambda, the failure rate, so your main time to failure will be with this expression, one over n lambda, and you will have some time frame to repair your servers. This is typical at the order of 10 hours or so, how long does it take you to fix a server? And if you have these set up, the fraction of the time you are going to spend with the repair would be this ratio. This is the case because you have no redundancy in this particular example. So this is your unavailability. Since you're fixing the system, your system is not available. So the availability will be my one minus this one, right? So this is your expression for availability with no redundancy at all. Um, and I have a rigorous proof if people want to see, I can show it later. What if you introduce one redundancy? Um, you can use the same technique here uh, with the Markov chain analysis. And if you follow through the math, it will look like this. And you can kind of see the pattern here. Whenever you introduce a redundancy, so you will have a factor of lambda divided by mu. And you can actually uh, repeat this exercise as many as C times, and then you will get the answer with C redundancies, which will be this expression. So the, the, the main takeaway from, from this one is that you can compute um, availability. Uh, this is kind of uh, in a simplified setting uh, because in a typical uh, enclosure, there will be many things that can go wrong. So you have to do a simulation, in fact. but you can at least check your simulation results with some analytical approximations to see whether they, they make sense or not. All right, so everything I have so far is analytical, which, which is the nice thing about this model. So everything can be computed instantly. It's not like simulations that take hours to complete. So that means you can take all of these formulas and just stick them into a web application. So what, what that will mean is that uh, you can just create this uh, panel on the left-hand side with all the inputs and people can come in and punch in their numbers and then the, the, this tool will report the durability, et cetera. So this one is showing you the multi-layer, but if you don't want to do multi-layer, for example, you can do uh, just pods level erasure coding, then you would be doing within box. I'm just showing this uh, because um, if you have some scenarios in mind, uh, you can probably reach out to us and we can run them through this tool and that will instantly tell us uh, what the durability will be. Um, and having said that, I think that will complete my presentation. Uh, I, I did have a couple of things in the backup related to Mac 2 and Reman, but uh, I just wanna save the time for questions and answers. And I will just go back to my summary page here. Again, we are here to help and collaborate uh, to develop um, pods and cortex uh, modeling further and make those models available to the open source community. And and I think that that's, that's all I have and I will want to open the floor for questions and answers. Um, okay. Hi, Sergey. Mm -hmm. It's Andre here. Uh, can you go back to this slide where you were discussing about the bad blocks and sure. how they affect the recover? Um, I have some question here. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I misunderstood, but did you say that if we have bad block during the recovery, uh, it means we cannot recover? If you are in the critical mode, yes, because there, there's no parity left. Ah, okay, I got it. Critical mode means that we, um, the um, uh, 
we are trying to recover from all the uh, failed drives we can cor support. Cor correct. So you lost all of your redundancy already because if you have C mm. redundancies, you lost C drives and you are trying to recover them all. That means you will need each and every bit of data in the healthy drives. Does that make sense? Yes, I got it now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sir Kate, a question on uh, failure distribution. So um, earlier you talked about how um, it's important to, to understand how um, failures don't necessarily always occur as an even distribution over you know, a fixed period of time. They can be Correct. clustered. Either, um, uh, and, and so how can we adapt the model for cases where we want to look at what would occur if we say we're targeting a 1% failure rate, um, you know, as, as kind of a baseline, and then due to uh, either a drive quality issue or something else that occurs, um, we end up with uh, greater than that. And that increase is something that takes place, say, after a year, right? So you start seeing a a dramatic uptick in failures that is against what our expectations are. Can we adapt the model to, to be able to, to explore what those cases would look like and what would happen to the cluster in that event? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what you can probably do is, is, is that, um, so this is your Markov chain model, right? This, this model works best if you have constant failure rate, but you can push it to, um, to the cases where um, the failure rate is changing over time. But it, it's a little tricky, but you can do that. So you can actually uh, feed in your lambda as a function of time, whatever it is, right? It may, it may be 1% in the first year, and then you can say, okay, I will bump it up to 2% in the second year. So you can feed that in to this lambda. So you, this model can handle variable uh, failure rate, whatever it is, right? It may, if it is viable distribution, then you would just uh, pull the pull the function from here for your hazard rate. So this is basically lambda. Uh, or if you have some empirical data that shows that you have a different distribution your, for your failures, you can feed that into the Markov chain model. Or and maybe end, you can do a simulation. You can just create that failure distribution in a simulation, just a Monte Carlo simulation, and, and just do a brute force calculation. Does it, does it make sense? Yes, it does, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, uh, this is Mandar here. Uh, so uh, can we extend this to, uh, or did we try extending this to other failure domains? Like right now we, talked about MTTF for a mm -hmm. drive, right? And, but uh, there are like other variables, like- uh, Correct. Cor uh, yes, yeah. um, that's a very good question. And it's something I am working on. I'll just show this plot again. So this one assumes that everything is driven by drive failures, right? Um, however, you could, for example, add several level failures here, assume, uh, you, you have a good model of predicting how servers may go bad. Maybe there, maybe the power surge, right? So if you have a power surge probability a model, what you can do is you can add another arrow here. So that will kill one pod at once, right? So this will be your failure rate. So you can throw in um, another failure mode into this methodology. Or uh, if you have multiple things, it gets very tricky to solve things analytically. So this may be as far as you can push it analytically. But what you can do is you can always do Monte Carlo simulation. You can you can uh, throw in all those failure modes into your simulation and just check what comes out. Uh, can we can we aggregate all these causes to this one effect uh, of try failure? So maybe like it, failure of yeah. It, it will depend. Um, you could if they show the same effect. For example, if you have if you have a, a failure mode that will kill one pod at a time, uh, you can add that onto this arrow, right? So you can just add them up. But assume you have uh, you you place those those pods into the same rack. So you have two two pods in the same rack, and maybe they are uh, feeding from the same power supply. So that means if there is a power surge, 
that uh, in, a, in a power supply that serves two pods at a time. And if, this, if, if something goes wrong with that, it will take down two pods at, at once. In that case, you'll have, to, you'll have an arrow from starting from here and it will, it will go in steps of two. So it will connect to here, right? It will kill two pods at a time or as many as you have in a single rack. So this, this is uh, intimately tied to the architecture you are looking at. So how many pods do you have uh, per rack or or maybe uh, pods, ha pods has uh, two, sir two pools per enclosure, right? So maybe these may be actually half of the pods. So you, 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 you can use pods to serve as two boxes, two independent boxes. But in that case, uh, that means you are going to take down two pools at once if the pods goes down. So, uh, and again, so it, can, it, it becomes very, very complicated to solve analytically, and that's when you should refer to numerical simulations. Oh, makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else we have? Yes. Okay. So from the community, we always get a question about how people can contribute from the open source community. Uh, you know, for for this area, is there any places that you know the open source community can start on or um, contribute to? I'm not sure if I can answer to that question. Maybe uh, Rachel or John Bent yeah. can answer. I'm part of that actually, and I'm just wondering okay. um, whether there's certain tests or anything that we can ask the community to to uh, to to do that might be helpful to your team or other areas that they want to get started. Maybe maybe that's something we can take offline too. I'm yeah, wondering. we can we can take it offline. But the, I I think the idea um, from this presentation is that we we are openly sharing this methodology, and we are very open to criticism and suggestions. If you think there is a better method to solve this problem, and I'll be very happy to discuss and push this forward. Right, this this model seems to be working, but it doesn't mean that it's the best one. So if people this have ideas. Yes, sir. This is John. I mean, Justin, if one thing that I think the community could help us with would be if anyone is running a data center and has actual, you know, distributions of failures that they've seen over time, uh, you know, I, I think we're always interested in getting data like that. Like the yeah. question that we had earlier about, you know, it's not a Weibull, it's not a uniform. Sometimes mm -hmm. you get little clusters of failure events, right? So if we could you know, get data from the field about failure cluster events, that would be something that would be super useful. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that would be very useful. We actually have um, several recent events that we can use as uh, real world examples of that, which is kind of motivating some of the, the questions. Mm -hmm. One of the other um, areas, and I, and I know Sir Kay, I've asked you about this uh, previously, I'd, I'd like to explore this further, perhaps offline, uh, is, um, more granularity toward failure domains and how we can adapt our models at a low level, but perhaps even more importantly, our discussions with customers at a much higher level about what's the best way to actually architect their solution in terms of how it is cabled, how it is utilized for redundancy. We had this discussion uh, in depth and it was quite a, a, a lively debate. I think many people on this call was, were participating in that about you know, do we use uh, cross connect to the pods when we're mm -hmm. dealing with SR, R1 and R2? And what are the cost implications, complexity, durability improvements, that type of thing? And, and where I'd like to see us go is uh, both up and down with that uh, discussion and, and to leverage your model so that we can really get into things like, um, you know, within a drive, you've got the individual platters. So we've got reman there. I know mm -hmm. we've got some work there in the model, but also within the enclosures, we've got expanders, we've got controllers, we've got different pieces that can all fail at different rates and have right. different splash damage when they do occur. And I know that's a tremendous amount of work, but I think it, it really would be a good place to continue this effort. That, that's true. There's a lot of work to do related to availability in particular, because there are, there are so many supporting pieces uh, that gets the data out of the drives and push, push it, pushes it to, to the outside world, right? And, each and every piece of those things can can fail, although there are some redundancies. So at, at, at that point, I, I think I'll have to do some simulations to see uh, to see the overall 
availability. And th there are features that we can explore uh, to, to, to see whether it makes sense in terms of durability or availability, like cross-connecting uh, uh, pools, etc. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, Shaki, uh, uh, are these uh, models available, I mean, uh, to try out uh, from public, somewhere publicly, uh, or, uh, or is it internal to seek it? So I think we are going to make this uh, presentation available, at least a static copy of it. Uh, but the the model, the web application is Seagate internal at this moment. Uh, Sergey, I have a question on the <clears throat> model. Um, uh, in the distributed parity, uh, uh, the wider pool we have, uh, the quicker uh, repair of the failed drive will be, uh, Correct. right? So does the model include uh, this time of repair with the side, with the width of the pool? Yes, it does. Uh, so, but just to be clear, the gain you get is not coming from the fact that you do the repairs faster just because you have a larger pool size. So for example, if you look at this one, right? So if you look at this loop, um, you are going to repair your failures very fast because you have you you'll be reading from 53 drives but the the thing is that your your failures will be accelerated as well compared to traditional rate so the traditional rate you would be dealing with 10 drives now you are dealing with 53 drives so your failure rate is five times the original one your recovery rate is five times the original one so you get nothing out of this one this loop doesn't give you anything in terms of durability this loop does give you gain because now you have this overlap. So the, the amount of data uh, you are recovering is reduced quite a bit and you are going and fixing them immediately. So that's the origin of the gain. It's not because you are repairing faster since you have a larger pool. It is because you are fixing the most immediate problems first. That's the origin of the gain. But uh, to, to answer your question, yes, the model includes the fact that you will be repairing, you, you'll be reading from all the drives at once in your repairs. That, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, kind of. What I meant is that um, the probability to have several failures at the same time uh, is uh, uh, Affected in this case, if we if we repair if we manage to repair quicker, the probability of uh, failing another drive at the same time when we repair is decreasing, right? Um, yes and no. Uh, um, so if you repair faster, that's correct. But now you have more drives, so now you are talking about the full drive, right? It's full full pool. So your your compared to the traditional rate. So you, you are dealing with 53 drives rather than uh, 10 drives. So your your failure rate will be increased, your repair rate will be increased, but they will increase at the same rate. So they kind of cancel out. And again, the, the reason why this thing is giving you benefit is because you are going and fixing the most problematic pieces first, if that makes sense. I think we are running out of time. I, I'm not sure if you want to continue, uh, Rachel. What, what what is the? Um. Yeah, we are just at time, so it okay. seems like it's a good jumping off point. But it seems like it's a great discussion. Um. Of course, everybody can continue this. Um. We have a Slack group for Cortex. Um. So if you go to the the GitHub, you can see that. You can email us at cortex-questions at cga.com. Um, and we will be doing another one of these sessions in a month. Um, so we hope to see everybody then as well. Um, I want to say thank you for Sergey for this sure. awesome presentation. Um, and for everybody for, um, joining us. So thank you so much and have a great day, everybody. All right. Thank you.